Okay, so Oh, sure. Okay, welcome everybody to this uh, second day. Let me just say before we start that there will be the the photo of the conference at 10. So please don't leave the room after his, his uh, lecture because we will get a picture of all of us here. We try at least. Uh, okay, so welcome everybody and uh, we go for the second lecture, right? Yes, of Aninda on the conformal bootstrap in mainly space. Please. Okay, so. Uh... So yesterday in the, in, in the afternoon, I gave a broad overview about this program, where this is going. And uh, since uh, a lot of uh, the program is actually uh, technical, I thought I will sketch out the details, omitting the technical uh, technicalities, and I'll point out how to, where you can learn about the technical details. Uh, and uh, hopefully uh, within this hour, uh, by the end of this hour, you will know uh, how we get these uh, same results as what Feynman diagram, uh, the, the Feynman diagram approach produces that I uh, told you uh, yesterday. Um, so, the, um, uh, so the key uh, uh, ingredient is melon space, and in some sense, melon space is natural also uh, uh, in the usual way that you think about conformal blocks. Uh, so let me just review that quickly. So this is... Uh, uh, Conformal blocks and uh, Mac polynomials. So conformal blocks in Mellin space, if you want. Uh, so there is a there is an integral representation of the conformal blocks. So the conformal blocks. Yesterday I told you that they satisfy a differential equation, but there is also an integral representation of the conformal block. Uh, uh, so I don't have uh, the time to review the integral representation, but if you want to learn about the integral representation. It's uh, very well uh, covered in uh, Dolan and Osborne in, uh, in 2011. Uh, so the, the idea is that uh, when we uh, write down the integral representation in, in position space, you need to do a certain class of integrals, which uh, look like this. So there is some uh, normalization factor here, but there is an integral of a position that you need to do. There's a product of these factors, uh, x minus xi raised to minus 2 li, uh, such that the summation over li is equal to d, the dimensionality, uh, and, the, and you have to do an integral over x. Now this uh, integral, these are conformal integrals, and uh, there is a famous formula in, uh, in conformal field theory that allows us to do that, which is called the simons star formula. Uh, so essentially, this, uh, the simons star formula converts this into a complex integral. And the result of that is, incidentally, so let me just make a note of that. So there is a, Simon, there's a formula called the simons star formula. It's called a star because you have x, and that x is joined to various uh, points, x, x1, x2, x3, x4, and you have, to, you have to carry out the integral over x. So it roughly speaking, looks like a star. Um, and uh, if you want to know the derivation of the simons star formula, there is, uh, it's given very well, at least the way that I learned it. The most accessible one instead of simons paper was uh, in an appendix of one of the early papers that Dolan and Osborne wrote. I think it's uh, the super conformal field theory paper in uh, 2002. But you can uh, look at the one of the first three papers that they co-authored, and it's in one of the appendices there. So, the, uh, so once, once you apply the simons star formula, what you get is this, so there's an integral over some set of variables which I'm labeling, uh, so these ij's are labels. Uh, there's a bunch of gamma functions, um, and then uh, finally some powers. So the x integral has been removed and uh, you've traded that for an integral over these uh, complex variables. 
Um, and uh, in this formula, uh, the SIJs are restricted uh, to satisfy these kind of constraints. And uh, yeah, and I wrote that. So for a four-point function, so this, this is actually true for uh, any n-point function, but for a four-point function, the number of independent SIJs are two. So this formula that I've written, I can run from one to n, it's completely general. Uh, but for a four-point function, there are two independent SIJs, and th these correspond uh, to uh, the fact that there are two independent cross ratios. Four-point function, uh, two independent SIJs, and uh, it's nicer to uh, make a transformation. You can solve for uh, them, so let's solve for S12 and S13. Uh, and then uh, nicer to redefine the coordinates uh, in this manner. So you introduce S and T instead of S sub one, two, and S sub one, three, you introduce S and T. So when, when you, uh, in terms of these variables, the conformal block, G U V in Mellon space looks like this. Um, so, uh, there is a function of S and T times a measure factor. It's conventional to pull this measure fa factor out. This measure factor that I'm pulling out uh, essentially comes from these product of gamma functions. Uh, it's just convention. Uh, you may pull it out or you may not pull it out, but it's convention to pull this factor out. Uh, times gamma of s plus t square uh, times u to the power s, v to the power t. So uh, uh, in terms of the u variable and uh, v variable, this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, complex integral is nothing but the Mellin transform with respect to these variables. The contour that you have is basically uh, uh, both these s and t contours run from minus i infinity to plus i infinity. Uh, with a possible, uh, possibly a shift, uh, and you close the contour on the right or the left, depending on uh, uh, which channel you're considering. So, for example, because this is, uh, uh, if you were in the S channel, you would express, expect u to be small, and so you uh, need to pick out uh, smaller powers of u, so you, you have to close the contour on the right. Um, this is the uh, Mellin transform of the conformal block, uh, and explicitly, it takes this form. There are loads and loads of gamma functions, uh, and it takes, uh, especially writing on a board, writing out everything, takes a lot of time. So I will just uh, write out the key pieces. And uh, times uh, projector, I'll explain what this is. Um, so uh, the explicit poles are in these gamma functions. So there are poles in S equals to delta minus L by 2 plus N, and S equals to D minus delta minus L by 2 plus N. So there are two sets of poles. These don't introduce poles. They will, uh, they will introduce zeros. And these zeros are extremely important uh, in the uh, in, in the uh, uh, representation of the conformal blocks. This is a polynomial. Uh, this is what is called the Mac polynomial. Uh, and it's a polynomial of degree L. So if it is a spin L uh, operator that you're, that you're getting exchanged, uh, if O is a spin L operator, then this is a Mac polynomial. S and T both have a degree L. Um, so there are two sets of poles here. So these are the usual physical uh, pieces that you would pick out. But there's also these pieces which are not physical because are, these are what are called the shadow pieces. So these are shadow poles. Um, uh, shadow poles are, uh, whenever you have an operator uh, whose dimension is delta, the shadow operator has dimension d minus delta. So you naturally get these shadow poles as well. And of course, you don't want the contribution of the shadow poles, so you require to add a projector 
which will project, project out the contributions of the shadow pool. So basically, the projector has zeros precisely where you have uh, the poles here. So for example, you could have uh, a, a trigonometric function like a sine function, which will get rid of these poles uh, without uh, changing the residue at s equal to delta minus l by 2 plus n. So uh, this is uh, what it is. Now, uh, one thing that I should point out that uh, the, the only poles uh, that are there are, come from this factor. And uh, you could add additional factors to this, which will leave the residue unchanged. Uh, and, uh, and also the location of the poles unchanged. So for example, if you added, um, see the, uh, say here the poles are at s equals to delta minus l by 2 plus n. So if you were looking at the sum over the residues at these poles, so you could write this as sum over some function of t over s minus delta minus l by 2 minus n, and you're summing over n, so there's a label here as well, these, these residues. Then actually, uh, you could add additional pieces like s over delta minus l by 2 plus n raised to whatever power that you want such that the residues and the location of the poles are unchanged. Is that clear? So for example, suppose I added a square, then uh, if I evaluate the residue at delta minus l by 2 plus n, this, this factor will, is going to become 1. So the residues are unchanged. There are no, it does not introduce any any additional poles, okay? And uh, the effect is simply that of adding a polynomial because you could have added and subtracted one. So this piece is uh, going to have S, uh, precisely this factor, and S plus delta minus L by two plus N. So you, you will be, uh, so this addi additional piece that you're adding is essentially a polynomial in S. Okay, so there are these kind of ambiguities that are there in these representations, yes. 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 So we will. Yeah, so we, we will, so his question is that uh, if, unless or until we are closing the contour on the right and using the residue theorem to pick up the, uh, the poles, uh, what does this projector actually mean? So if we just need, uh, if we can't close the contour on the right, that's what he's asking. So we are going to assume that we will be able to close the contour on the right and it falls off fast enough, which will allow us to close the contour on the right. And you uh, might have to uh, use the fact that u is less than one or some, something along those lines so that you get an exponential suppression coming from the, these kind of factors. So that's an important point. Yes. You, you cannot add arbitrary uh, factors. The project, projector has to uh, be such that it allows you to close the contour. That's, that's correct. Okay. So we won't require the explicit representation of the Mach polynomials. The Mach polynomials uh, actually look pretty complicated. They are multiple sums, multiple finite sums. Uh, but there, there is no compact, uh, nice expressions that are known for the Mach polynomials, unfortunately. Um, uh, this explicit representation of the Mach polynomials can be found in that paper by Dolan and Osborne in 2011. Um, So uh, motivated by the structure, Mac uh, in 2009, and I suppose, uh, uh, yeah, in, in, uh, in 2009, uh, he actually uh, proposed that the Mellin transform, he proposed a Mellin transform of a CFT amplitude, Mellin transform of CFT correlator, Um, he proposed that it's natural to think about the Mellin transform of a CFT correlator, leading to the definition of what is uh, referred to as a Mellin amplitude. So 
this is your CFT correlator in position space, identical scalars for simplicity. You pull out this position dependent factor. Um, and then uh, for any four point function, a generalization of a four point function of this kind, you, you can define a Mellin amplitude in this way. Uh, it's conventional to pull this factor out, and this factor uh, satisfies some nice properties, and uh, we will uh, make use of that. So this is something that I will refer to as some measure factor. As I said, it's, it's convention. Um, and um, this uh, MST here is what is referred to as the Mellon amplitude. And uh, it satisfies uh, certain uh, nice properties. It's supposed to be a meromorphic function. So this Mellon amplitude M S T is uh, a meromorphic function. It only has simple poles, meromorphic function. It has simple poles, no branch cuts. Um, uh, it has poles in different channels. Uh, these poles correspond, are located at uh, twist by two plus n. So twist was delta minus L, and that's what where it is. The poles are at delta minus L by two, so this is twist by two plus n. Uh, uh, the residues uh, uh, at these poles are related to, residues are related to three point functions. to three-point correlators uh, and exhibit factorization. And um, going from one channel to other, so if you wanted to start off with uh, an S-channel expression of that kind, if this is an S-channel expression, by that I mean that you're taking the first two operators uh, and uh, doing the operator product expansion, and you're taking the last two and doing it. So that is what I was calling the S-channel yesterday. Then to go from the S-channel to the T-channel, so this was the S-channel, so one, two, three, four. The T-channel is this expression when I'm taking one and four close together, and two and three close together, and the U-channel is the usual way that you, we would think of the U-channel one and three, two and four. So this is S, this is T, and this is U. So if you start off with the S-channel expression, to go to the T-channel, S to T, you need to make the following rep uh, replacement, and this I'll leave an, as an exercise. It's very easy to actually do this. Uh, you have to go from S-channel to the T-channel. You have to make the following replacement. S goes to T plus delta phi, and T goes to S minus delta phi in my conventions. And if you want to go from the S channel to the U channel, then you have to make the replacement S goes to delta phi minus S minus T, uh, leaving T uh, untouched. So this is how you go from one channel to the other. Oh, sorry, yeah, 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 yeah thank you, yeah. We don't change the... We don't change the position. Yeah, thanks. Uh, not arbitrary. If I put in an arbitrary amplitude, it might not satisfy the, uh, these properties. I mean, uh, you want them to satisfy. If, if it satisfied, then obviously they were they would be crossing symmetric on their own, right? You mean when because the anomalous dimension goes to zero or something or? or? Okay, yeah. Yeah. Right. But, 
Right, but that's in the, in the limit of L goes to infinity. So even if L is large and finite, you have... Again, you have to repeat the question, sorry. So or his question comments. is that uh, he's complaining that this is M, M is not strictly a metamorphic function because uh, when you have these large, uh, large twist operators, the, uh, sorry, large spin operators, then uh, yeah, uh, they will uh, accumulate um, because they'll have the same, I mean, uh, uh, so for example, uh, twist two large spin will all have, land up having the same anomalous dimension approximately because the anomalous dimension uh, goes to zero, so they have this, roughly speaking, the same dimension. So the, the poles uh, in that limit would sit on top of each other, so that'll, all the poles will coalesce and it'll become a branch cut. So that's what he's, that, that's what you're saying or something, yeah. Or a branch cut or something. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, th that is in the strict L going to infinity limit. I, yeah, that is true, yeah. So uh, I'm pretending that L is large but finite so that they are never on top of each other if you want. Uh, you, you could, uh, except that uh, uh, in, in, in the, for the four-point function, uh, I use the fact that it is just a function of the reduced correlator, is just a function of u and v, and as a result of, a result of which I just had uh, u, the uv space corresponding to this st space. Uh, you could define Mellin transform for anything. I mean, in Feynman diagrams, you, you do use uh, mellin bonds techniques. Uh, Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. So this M of ST actually satisfies some uh, other properties. I'll make a note of these here. And uh, these are also trivial to derive, so I'll just make a note of these and uh, leave uh, them as an exercise for you to derive. Uh, so suppose uh, you start off with the S channel. So this is the S channel, one, two, three, four. Now, of course, it does not make any difference if I interchanged three and four or one and two. Uh, that should not affect uh, uh, that uh, the, the representation for the correlator. Uh, and so that actually tells you that M of ST, and I'll put a suffix S, to uh, denote it by, uh, denote the channel, so M of ST is uh, going to be equal to M of S, S of minus S minus T. So that's one property. And uh, this is actually a, a property that is respected by the Mach polynomials. So this is the symmetry of the Mach polynomials for identical scalars. Uh, but that you know uh, where this uh, comes from now. Uh, and uh, using this, and this is actually important, you can show that if I write down an expression of this kind, use this property, and this is again an exercise, you can show that m of st plus m of t plus delta phi s minus delta phi plus m of delta phi minus s minus t, which is basically the sum of, so if, you, if, if this is the s channel, then this would be the t channel, and this would be the u channel uh, from that uh, transformation that I've written right in the end. Uh, this expression, times this measure u to the power s, v to the power t, ds dt, divided by 2 pi i squared. This expression is going to be manifestly uh, crossing symmetric in the sense that if I use this expression, go to the, uh, make this transformation to the t channel, or I use that expression, make the transformation to the u channel, it will remain invariant. And uh, it's, this, this, uh, this is actually important to show uh, that this is true. This measure factor that I've pulled out, which is this, I've written it in several places. So delta phi minus s square, gamma of delta phi minus s square, gamma of minus t square, gamma of s plus t square, is actually invariant under all three transformations. 
So uh, well, both, both of these transformations. Both of these transformations. Is that clear? Yeah. Thank you. So M is a mailing amplitude and it's automatically crossing symmetric, right? Well, it has all this. Properties. If it is, uh, if I add up all three channels, it's crossing symmetric. But suppose I give you some arbitrary function of S and T, okay. M of S T. It doesn't have to be. Yes. So, what uh, is the definition of M? It's not a mailing transform. No, it's some function. Okay, let's let's call this let's call this F. Yeah, I, sh I should okay. call it F. Okay, yeah. thanks. Sorry. Yes. Sorry. I should call it F, and F is such a function that satisfies this property. Then you can show that this new function that I've constructed is crossing symmetric. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, sorry for confusing the notation. Yeah, is that point clear? Okay. Now, now suppose I started off by saying that f of st was this. Uh, uh, the melon amplitude, uh, the melon amplitude corresponding to uh, the usual conformal block, and I tried to make a crossing symmetric uh, correlator by just adding the various channels. <clears throat> so can you can you do that? So the first observation that you have is that the s channel here has this set of zeros at delta phi minus s square gamma of delta phi minus s squared, so s equals to delta phi plus n, those are zeros, those are, those are double zeros. Now, gamma of delta phi minus s squared, when you do that replacement to go to the t-channel, this factor just simply becomes gamma of minus t-square, so that the t-channel expression, which is this, so this will be proportional to one over gamma of delta phi minus s square. So these double poles that comes from the measure at s equal to delta phi plus n, they cancel. But this guy under the transformation is going to become gamma of minus t square. So the double poles that this measure has at s equal to delta phi plus n will remain. Similarly, for this, this will become gamma of delta phi minus s uh, minus or rather, this is s plus t square. This factor, when you do this transformation to the u channel, is going to become this factor. So both the t and u channels will have uh, double poles that come from this measure factor because this will have gamma of delta phi minus s square. Is this point clear? Is this, uh, yeah. The, the measure is this uh, factor that I've pulled out. So that's, that is mu of st. That is the definition of the measure. OK, a f of st is just this capital B. So imagine that we are doing it for the usual uh, s channel conformal block. So that the usual s channel conformal block has this 1 over gamma of delta phi minus s square. And that is expected because you don't want there to be uh, any poles except the, the physical ones. So the, the, these are completely expected. So what I'm saying is that suppose you started off by con considering this little f to be the s-channel conformal block, the usual conformal block, trying to make it crossing symmetric. Then the crossed pieces, which will be the t and u channels, will have these double poles corresponding to uh, this factor. OK? Uh, so the point that I'm trying to make is that, and this is something that you can convince yourself, that Regardless of whatever expression that you start off with here, so suppose you thought that you would be able to add these or some factors that will get rid, get rid of these double poles that are there in the measure, you will always land up with a crossing symmetric expression which will have some uh, poles that come from the measure factor. So that's the point that I'm trying to make here. So let me just emphasize that. So you might have thought that, OK, instead of this gamma of delta phi minus s squared, suppose I started off with 1 over gamma of delta phi minus s squared times gamma of minus t squared times gamma of s plus t squared. That will get rid of all the uh, double poles that are there in the measure. But you can't do that because 
the S channel would then have the wrong residues. They'll have the wrong residues corresponding to the physical poles. So you can't add arbitrary things. Uh, so uh, there is no way of getting a crossing symmetric expression which is free of any spurious, and I'll uh, start calling them spurious poles, any spurious poles that comes from this measure factor. Is that clear? It's spurious poles because you don't expect to see them in the operator product expansion. Okay? So you can do an explicit calculation. Um, now, Um, suppose, uh, so uh, in, in this expression I started off by saying that let's suppose the, this was the usual conformal block, so and I said that you will start having these spurious pole contribution in the cross channels, so you won't be able to build this crossing symmetric expression of this kind, but suppose you did this calculation for uh, uh, using Wheaton diagrams, and uh, for simplicity let's consider just a scalar exchange Wheaton diagram. So this is just a scalar exchange. Uh, you write down the bulk to boundary, uh, boundary to bulk, bulk to bulk. These are all the bulk to boundary propagators. And you do the calculation in the usual way. Then uh, the expression, the Mellin amplitude for this diagram uh, has been worked out by several people. Uh, for example, you can find this expression in a paper by uh, Penedones or uh, Paulos. This expression has been worked out and uh, you can, uh, the expression takes on the following form. So in terms of the reduced amplitude in terms of U and V, uh, the Mellin amplitude, so I've pulled out this measure factor, is just a 3F2 hypergeometric function whose arguments are delta minus, delta by two minus S one plus delta by two minus delta phi, same factor there. One plus delta by two minus s, delta minus d by two plus one, and all evaluated at one, at the unit argument. So three F2 has three entries, so these, these are uh, uh, the AIs and these are the BIs in a hypergeometric function. <coughs> so this is a three F2 hypergeometric function. And also there is, uh, all this is divided by delta minus s over two. <clears throat> okay, so you see the point here is that if I look at the S channel Wheaton diagram, which is the S channel exchange, then the Mellon representation of the Wheaton diagram is such that it no longer has these zeros, it does not have this factor. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, yes, yes. Uh, is that point clear? So the usual conformal block has this factor, which, uh, which gets rid of the, the, these additional S-dependent poles that come from this measure. You do the Wheaton diagram calculation, and you will find that that particular factor is gone. It's no longer there. That's actually, uh, in some sense, it's desirable in, this, in the sense that now, if you go from the S channel to the T channel and the U channel, if you now add the S plus T plus U in the usual way, all three channels will now have these double poles that come from the measure factor. Is that clear? It's a, real statement, so Wheaton diagrams uh, have uh, double poles from the measure. Okay, now in the 
language of ADS-CFT, you are, you're familiar with this because whatever poles are coming from the measure, where are they located? So the poles are located when it uh, comes from this factor, gamma of delta phi minus S squared. This corresponds to S equals to delta phi plus N. And uh, the physical dimension of the operators, because the physical operators have, are located at uh, delta minus L by 2 plus N. So the physical dimension of the operators would be S equals to 2 delta phi because of this factor, plus L plus 2N. So these operators are what in the ADS safety language are called double trace operators. And uh, so from the ADS safety in the large N limit, the measure factor actually uh, takes into account the contribution from these double trace operators. So that's why uh, from the Mellon uh, amplitude point of view, don't require to uh, add the contribution of the double trace operators uh, in the Mellon amplitude. They are taken into account by this measure. Now, in the large end limit, that is okay, but here I'm really not talking about a large end limit. I've just made an observation that is independent of any large end limit or anything of that kind. Um, now, in usual CFTs, you don't have operators with exactly these dimensions. There's always an anomalous dimension. It may be small, but then there's an anomalous dimension. There are no physical operators unless and until there's an extra symmetry. If there is a, a supersymmetry or something that protects the dimension of the operator, then you can have dimensions of this kind. But in usual theories, you do not have operators of this kind. <clears throat> so these cannot be uh, physical poles. And that's why we call them spurious poles. Contributions, gamma of delta phi minus s square contributions have to cancel in a physical amplitude. And this is the key point. So we'll get a bunch of uh, consistency conditions by looking at these cancellation conditions. Okay, so, so this is an important point, so if you have any questions, do ask. Yeah. Yes. Uh, what, 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 do you, what do you mean? Uh, so you said that yes. Yeah, in the strict n going to infinity limit, the dimensions of the double trace operators is literally that. Yeah. There are, there are no physical, yeah, correct. There are no physical operators with this, this dim, these dimensions because there are always anomalous dimensions which take you away from this. Uh, Right. I mean, so uh, it depends on, so you, uh, in, uh, in the usual way that you write down Wheaton diagrams, you're doing an one over n expansion even at the level of the measure. Okay. So in one over n expansion, the leading piece that you have is the n going to infinity piece, where these are actually uh, the double trace operators. And the subleading pieces will take you away, away from that. Yeah, I mean, it's a different way that we set up the ADS safety calculation. Here I'm just saying that, uh, that uh, if I try to construct a crossing symmetric amplitude, so what, what was the logic? We, we said that we are going to try to construct a basis that is crossing symmetric by adding the S, T, and U. And you could have started by trying to take the S uh, uh, channel expression to be the usual conformal block. The logic was that if you did that, then in the T and U channels, you'll still have these spurious poles uh, coming from the contribution from the measure factor. So uh, um, that is something that uh, uh, is not desirable because only 
only the cross channel will, ha will have these spurious poles. Now, uh, if I started off with the, what are called the Wheaton diagrams, then I said that, uh, uh, look here, uh, the, the S channel Wheaton diagram uh, does not have these zeros, and so the S channel Wheaton diagram will have these so-called so spurious poles. The interpretation, interpretation of the spurious poles in the large n limit, or n going to infinity limit, are that they are the double trace operators. So that's why uh, in the large n limit, if you expanded everything, in one over n expansion, then the leading contribution would have these operators. But ge in general, you do not s expect to see operators of this dimension, precisely this dimension, because here I'm not doing any large n. Here I'm not expanding anything. Here I'm setting up the exact expressions. There's no expansion, so there are no operators with precisely these dimensions. So that's an assumption that I'm making that there are no, typically there are no operators of that kind unless and until there is some symmetry that protects the dimensions. So that's the assumption. And that's why the, uh, we are calling the poles that come from this gamma of delta phi minus s square as spurious poles. Any other questions? Sorry. So, yeah. So, if there are BPS theories where uh, you have uh, dimensions that are protected, then you have to handle it differently. So, that, that's, uh, that's a good point. That's an important point. So, there are. Uh, uh, if for example, n equal to four, you would need to handle it a little, uh, little differently. <clears throat> okay. So, so now what we do is that uh, we expand so suppose we have an arbitrary line and should erase some things So uh, suppose uh, m of st corresponds to the Mellin amplitude of some uh, correlator that you want to consider. What we're going to do is we're going to expand this. In the basis of tree level exchange Wheaton diagrams. For this particular case, the tree level, uh, so here I've just considered the uh, delta comma zero, but then you can do the analysis for delta comma L. The expression, expressions are known. So what happens in the usual, uh, in, in the actual case is that you have some uh, piece that looks like the three F2, but in addition, you also have a contribution from the Mac polynomial. So if, if I have delta comma L here, then there will be a piece that uh, comes from the Mac polynomial. So there'll be some piece that looks like that. So this is a contribution from Mac. These deltas get shifted. Uh, so there'll, there'll be some uh, L dependent shifts. So these arguments get shifted. Uh, that's not, uh, uh, how they get shifted is not important. Um, but what is important is that when we ex expand in the basis of the tree level exchange Wheaton diagrams, you have spurious poles at s equals to delta phi plus n. So n goes from zero to infinity. And these are double poles. So each spurious pole, because it's a gamma of, it's a double pole, gamma of delta phi minus s square times u to the power s. When you complete the s integral, then you will get u to the power delta phi plus n log u and u to the power delta phi plus n. Both of these are incompatible, incompatible with OPE with the S-channel OPE. So, 
these have to cancel. Uh, and so uh, you will get a whole set of consistency conditions that arise from these cancellations. Yes? The what? Sorry? Computation using Witten diagram instead of doing a just general mean field theory or generalized free theories. I mean, I don't see why you need an holographic description. I want to see. Yeah, you don't. Is, we don't require it's a holographic just, description. Uh, for you, it's, it's a convenient way to to study generalized free correct. theories. Correct. Uh, I wouldn't call them even generalized free fields. It's just a convenient way that. Uh, um, I, I mean, uh, if you want, I could have just avoided uh, referring to Witten diagrams at all. Uh, I could have just said that. Look, uh, if I did the usual case, then I just have these spurious poles from both these, both these channels. And uh, as I argued that it is impossible to remove the spurious poles, whatever I do, so it's better to actually introduce spurious poles in all three channels, and then I try to uh, make sure that they cancel. But so I mean, I, when you say Witten diagram, I guess you're referring to a scalar in ADS, that's it. Yeah, scalar right. in ADS, yes. With, with, with the ADS, with the... Uh, with the I've with not the, specified any bulk interaction or anything no, of that no, kind. No dynamical gravity. No dynamical gravity. So, it's yeah, just, I mean, that's what... It's just kinematical, mean. yeah. Yes. Correct. So I could have avoided this uh, notion of Wheaton diagrams, except that what we are doing is exactly Wheaton diagrams. It's, uh, this is what you would call uh, Wheaton diagrams. But then if you wanted, I could have just avoided uh, talking about any of these Wheaton diagrams at all. I, could, I would have said that I want, want uh, the spurious poles from each channel. The best thing to do is to start off with a conformal block representation and uh, get rid of that zeros that comes from these gamma functions that are there in the denominator. Okay, just to understand, the, the, um, if you take the generalized free theory that for which we know everything by now, yeah. and you do the mailing transforms, I think you should get automatically the same. I mean, okay, it's, it's, uh, probably it's already worked out, I mean. You, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, in the, the, the disconnected piece which comes from this generalized free field, that is, uh, I mean, that's what you probably have in mind. Uh, you, you're saying that can we reproduce the generalized free field answer from this, so, so what's your question, sorry? No, I'm saying that you should be able to, um, I, I, I'm essentially repeating what I said, that you should be able to not, never mention with and that. Yeah, correct, so. I agree with that. Yes, okay. yes, I agree with that, yes. Yes. I mean, uh, yeah, the disconnected pieces are added in by hand by introducing, using, uh, introducing explicit poles at the appropriate location. So uh, what we are saying is that, uh, I mean, uh, suppose, uh, uh, so you want to, uh, suppose, uh, so, so you, the usual uh, thing would be, uh, the gen generalized free field answer, for example, would be one plus u by v to the power delta phi uh, plus u to the power delta phi times that factor of x1, 2 to the 2 delta phi, x3, 4 to the 2 delta phi. Uh, this just comes from the ex identity exchange in the T channel, and this just comes from the identity exchange in the, in the U channel. So to reproduce this, we will just add in by hand uh, something that has poles at s equal to delta phi and uh, T equals to minus delta phi. So this is something that we're going to do by hand, if you want. Okay. The disconnected piece we are adding in by hand. So again, you understand this integral really is just a s series of poles. Yes. Because when, when we, it's a bit confusing. When we write this Melling integral, uh, one of its power is that you can close the contour to the left or to the right. But it seems that you cannot do this here anymore. As soon, because as soon as you added this piece, one of the poles will go to the left, and uh, that, that's what you're asking? Yeah, for example, this yes. does not converge. This integral over ds and dt does not converge. Yeah, but there is a u to the power s, v to the power t. Right. So, yeah. so depending on, uh, depending on uh, what you're choosing for u and v, and for example, if you put u equal to a quarter, it will have an exponential suppression. Yes, but let me take u equal to 3. Yeah, that won't. Correct. Then it will not really work. Right. Okay. That's so correct. Yes. We really are just closing the contour. So we are just uh, really closing the contour, and we are actually saying that we are looking at 
the full expression from the perspective of the S-channel OPE. So we are looking at uh, closing the contour in only one of the directions. Yeah. Yeah, we are not literally picking up the physical contributions from each channel. So I think that is what you are asking. So we are not literally picking up the contrib physical contributions from each channel. That's not what we are doing. We won't get three times the answer. We'll literally get the answer only once. I mean, sorry to, to interrupt you again, uh, but I think, yeah, I mean, Matteo was pointing out to me correctly. Clearly, gen completely generated 3D will be completely disconnected. So uh, my, uh, let me re-ask the question. So what is, what, what's that, that, that cubic coupling? What's that, that cubic coupling of the Witten diagram that you are choosing? This one? No, so we are just using, th there's no cubic coupling. I mean, there's no coupling constant that we are putting here. This is just the bulk to bulk propagator. Yeah. This is just the bulk to boundary propagator, nothing. I mean, we are not, there's no explicit vertex factor that we are thinking of there. So is there a, a real connected term or there are few purely disconnected? I'm a bit confused. No, so there is, is a, there is a, the, the uh, I mean, this is the, just a connected part of the correlator, uh, if you want. But the way that we calculate uh, Wheaton diagrams is to use these uh, bulk, bulk to bulk, bulk to boundary propagators. But if there was an explicit vertex, that would give rise to a contact term as well. So they, that is something that we are not uh, considering uh, because those will uh, contribute polynomials. Those would be uh, related to the polynomial ambiguity in, in the Wheaton diagram. So that is something, so since they are ambiguous, uh, we are making a choice and uh, we are making some choice and throwing them away. Yes. Does that answer your question? So if you, for example, uh, literally looked at the Wheaton diagram, it has to have the, correct, uh, the appropriate poles with the appropriate residues that are, that are compatible with conformal invariance. So you know where the poles are supposed to be. Uh, they have to be at s equal to twist by two plus n. And the residues are fixed by conformal invariance. They will be related to the Mac polynomials. So those, so those are things that you do not, you cannot tamper with. There are other things that you can tamper with, which are these polynomial pieces. And that's up to, up to you to fix. Yeah. Does that make sense? Up to a point? Okay. Yeah, please ask, because uh, I will just sketch out what we do uh, in the next uh, couple of minutes and how we solve in the Wilson, for the Wilson-Fisher case, how, how we extract results. Okay, so let me just uh, sketch out some of the details as to how you would use these uh, cancellation conditions and uh, extract results. So actually, uh, so this came from the U piece, but there is also a V dependence. So uh, there is for e, uh, there is actually, if you wanted to expand around V equal to one, for example, you would get u to the power delta phi plus n times one minus v to the power m times this factor. And similarly here, so actually you would get an infinite uh, set of equations that are labeled by two integers n and m, and n and m here. Uh, and for each of these pairs, uh, you, you get a cancellation condition. Um, and how do we make use of those cancellation conditions? So, what is convenient, as I mentioned in my uh, second lecture yesterday, that uh, if you look at the Mac polynomial, so Mac polynomial was a function of S and T. If you look at the Mac polynomial precisely at S equal to delta minus L by two, and for any value of T, then this is nothing but what is in the mathematical literature, what is referred to as a continuous Hahn polynomial. Uh, the continuous Hahn polynomial is proportional to a specific kind of a 3F2. And uh, the orthonormality conditions are known, so in particular, if you there is a measure factor, I will write out the measure factor, it's gamma square S plus T, gamma square of minus T, and if you take two of these polynomials, 
labeled by L comma zero and uh, it's convenient to instead of looking at it at uh, looking at it as being labeled by delta yeah let's let's consider this to be labeled by s then uh, when you do the integral over t then this is just proportional to uh, a chronic delta the proportionality constant is all known it's worked out uh, a good uh, source uh, for this is the book on special functions by ASCII, Richard ASCII, uh, Andrews and Roy. Um, and so using this uh, orthonormal polynomial, what you can do is you can uh, expand the t-dependence in each of these cancellation conditions. So what you can do is you can write the t-dependence in the following way. So that you don't have to worry about what value of t you're going to choose. The t-dependence is all in terms of these continuous Hahn polynomials. So for each of these, uh, each L prime, you'll get a can cancellation condition. So we set the coefficient of q l prime comma zero t, which is just a number because it has no t, no t dependence, it has no s dependence, the coefficient is just a number, or just, a, it has no s or t dependence anymore, because s we are setting equal to delta phi plus n, and t has been factored out, so we will set that equal to zero, and get, uh, and look at these conditions. Okay, is that idea clear? Okay. So in the, la in the last few minutes, I suppose I have another five minutes, or uh, three minutes. How do we make, uh, how do we make progress from here? Uh, so if you look at these conditions and set D equals to four minus epsilon for the Wilson Fisher, you start by writing delta phi as one, and actually you don't require to specify this to be one. This works out to be one as a leading contribution. You write it like this in, in an epsilon expansion, and whatever double field operators that you have, also you write it in the same way. These numbers, integers that I'm writing here, these actually pop out from the calculation. You don't have to start by assuming that this is two. and so on, and you do the same thing for the uh, double field uh, higher spin operators, which uh, gradients, so you write them as uh, in the same way. You do the same thing for the OPE coefficients. Again, the OPE coefficients also, you don't require to specify uh, the order at which they, they start. Uh, it comes out from the analysis. So OPE also you write, so for example, the C phi 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 square, you would write this as C0 plus C1 epsilon plus C2 epsilon square and so on. C phi phi stress tensor, also you would write in the same way, uh, dot dot dot. So what you start by looking at is that there is a, so each equation now gets labeled by L prime so you look at the L prime equal to zero and L prime equal to two equation. You look at these together. You demand that there's a conserved stress tensor, a unique conserved stress tensor. So the dimension of this is four minus epsilon. The, the dimension is, uh, delta is four minus epsilon. And uh, that's it, that's the input that you need to uh, put in. Uh, you look at it in, in the epsilon expansion. 
uh, and you, rec uh, you get a bunch of algebraic equations for this delta phi 1, delta phi 2, and so on. Looking at L prime equal to 0 and L prime equal to 2 is sufficient to fix this to be equal to minus half, this to be equal to 1 over 108, and also delta phi 3 epsilon cubed. This number is known to be 109 over 11,664. Uh, all these numbers come out from these analysis. And Atish, if you're there in the audience and still awake, this was the point that I was trying to make. This is 1 over 108. This is 109 over 11,664. So this is roughly speaking the same as this. So, yeah. Eh. No, no. Uh, so uh, we can determine only up till three loops. Uh, the six loop corrections are known. Uh, I don't remember the numbers, precise numbers, but I think they are comparable. Uh, yeah, I, I, off the top of, off top of my head, I don't really know. Yeah. I know that people consider this Pade Borel resummation, uh, uh, and somehow the numbers are not very different from what you get by setting epsilon equal to one at this level. You also fix uh, this guy. This actually works out to be minus two third. This works out to works out to be 19 over 162. And that's, uh, the, uh, that's as much as you can do for phi square. For the, yeah. And uh, looking at just L, L, L prime equal to 0 and L prime equal to 2, you can also fix the OP coefficients. The OP coefficients for the stress tensor, phi phi stress tensor, you can fix all the way up to epsilon cubed. And the OP coefficient for phi 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 square, you can fix up to epsilon square. What you land up getting is a relation between the epsilon cubed OP coefficient with the cubic anomalous, uh, cubic order anomalous dimension here. So that's, uh, that's the relation that you derive. And uh, if you look at the known result from Feynman diagrams, that relation is actually, uh, I mean, yeah, so the, once you use that relation, then you can fix C3. But there are consistency conditions that C3 satisfies, which passes those. Uh, to look uh, to de determine uh, the double field operators, you need to set L prime to be arbitrary. So L prime equal to some uh, even integer. And you can specify L prime to be arbitrary. And then uh, the formulas that I showed uh, in the end of my uh, second lecture in terms of the harmonic numbers, those actually just pop out. It's not something that we do order by order and we fix it. It, it just pops out in terms of the harmonic numbers. Um, and so that's roughly speaking uh, how we do these calculations. And I, uh, I'm sorry I had to rush, uh, but since this is my last lecture, uh, I wasn't able to give you as, many, as much details as I would have liked to. But then uh, if, you, uh, uh, if you're interested in knowing more, I can uh, discuss with you in person, and I'll tell you how exactly things work. So I'll stop there. Thanks.